Ciao, Mahaba, and good eye, mate. Adam Cleary from 442 here. And Chelsea fans, I don't know how you do this. No sooner have they gone on a late surge to end the season on a high, have they parted company with manager Maurizio Pochettino. And the question is now, again, what happens next? And while I don't have the answer to that one yet, I can tell you precisely why he has chosen to go and why the club are happy to let him leave. So let's, let's look at that. All right, so before we start, I just want to let you know mentally where I am here, right? This was me at the start of the season. Uh, Chelsea are winning the Premier League this season. I, yeah, right. Look, I know, I know, I know, I know. And this is me now, which is why I said I don't know how Chelsea fans do this, because I have visibly aged about 10,000 years watching this team this season. And this, by and large, was that Chelsea side. This is the formation you most commonly saw them in, and these are the players that most commonly filled those positions. Now, obviously, it wasn't just this lot. Like, Mudrick had a lot of minutes here, and Colwell had a lot of minutes between left centre-back and left back. Sanchez, we was the first choice goalkeeper when he was fit. Badi Ashili was in and out, but just pretty much this was your 11 this season. But a major thing that happened over the last couple of weeks was the injury to Enzo Fernandez. So his lack of availability meant that they sort of went to this sort of three box three system with Mark Kukurea playing as an inverted fullback alongside Caicedo, Gallagher pushing up from a deeper position. And all of a sudden they looked really quite coherent and really quite good. Which is, of course, not something that is supposed to happen when you lose a £100 million marquee signing of the current administration. But that is at the very core of what has been wrong with Chelsea this season and why we have just seen Pochettino leave. It is all about who, as a football team, they are. And also, who they're not. So, who are they then? Well, the season is finished, and if we look at their numbers across the entire course of it, they are incredibly confusing. Now, the very short version of this is that they rank really highly for possession football because that is the profile of loads of players in their squad. But also, at the same time, they rank really highly for, like, direct attacking football because that is the profile of all the magic imps and fairies in Mauricio Pochettino's brain. And that, as I've said, is a very confusing type of team to be. Now, you're really going to have to pay attention for the next couple of minutes because this is incredibly data-heavy, but just sort of stick with me. Right, so Chelsea ranks second in the league for the total number of touches in the defensive penalty area and the defensive third. So naturally, you might assume that that means they're really good at building out from the back. They have loads of the ball here because that's how they like to start attacks, right? <laughs> no, wrong. In terms of the number of successful build-up attacks, they They've had, which is like the measure of how good a team is at working it from back to front and making something happen, they drop off all the way down to eight. For context here, it's Brighton who rank top for all these touches. They're the only team who do more of that than Chelsea, and they only drop off to third behind Man City and Arsenal, who are just like top of every stat. And so the reason that number ends up being so high is they just knock it around aimlessly at the back. They don't really know what to do with it. They're not good enough to be incisive and get through a mid or a low block. So they just rack up pass after pass after pass. So they have a lot of the ball, but you would not call them an effective possession team, right? But what Pochettino really wants them to be is this like aggressive front foot high pressing team. And they score really highly for that as well. Like the joint fourth in the league for passes per defensive action, which is the measure of how sort of like proactive you'll be when the other team have got the ball. How much will you let them do before you smash into them with a defensive action? They're right between Arsenal and Newcastle for that particular stat, and those are two teams who are great at it. So again, naturally, you'd assume they're doing a lot of that. They must get a lot of goals that way, right? <laughs> no, no, also wrong. They get a reasonable amount of high turnovers from this aggressive style, but they drop all the way to ninth for the number of those they turn into chances and then drop all the way to 14th for the number of those they turn into goals, like one above Sheffield United. And what gives you that drop-off is situations like this. Like, this is a really good time to press the opposition. Conor Gallagher recognises that. He charges the opposition, which will help keep your passes per defensive action quite low. But nobody does it with him. So even if he does win the ball back, they're very unlikely to create a chance and even less likely to create a goal. Like, ultimately, it leaves Chelsea with a compromised brand of football. And what does a compromised brand of football win you? The FA Cup. Just in this instance, FA stands for f*** all. 
So again, just to recap, loads of the ball at the back, but not an effective possession side, and really proactive and front foot in the opposition's third, but not an effective high-pressing team. So... What does work for them? Well, they also score really highly. In fact, they're second in the league for the total number of take-ons. So a player gets a ball at his feet, he runs at an opponent, and he successfully gets past them. And unlike the other two stats, there's no drop-off here at all. In fact, they are the top team in the Premier League for creating chances as a direct result of running at an opponent. Which obviously sounds really good, but that is like the complete opposite of having a clear and defined system. Like there's a huge drop off for possession, there's a huge drop off for high pressing, but they're really good at somebody just getting the ball and going, do you know what, nothing's happening here, I'll have to do it myself. Like that stat is the most individual way of creating a chance and the fact they score so highly for that should scream at you from the numbers themselves that so often these very talented players find that the system is not working but here is simultaneously the other major problem they've got and the thing that should actually encourage them the most that they are going in the right direction right they create the most chances as a result of these take-ons but they don't score the most goals. Their conversion rate from all the chances they get from these take-ons is only 14%. And the next most prolific team in this stat is Newcastle, and their conversion rate is over double that. Like, it's nearly 30%. And this is something that I and indeed loads of people have been saying about Chelsea this season. For large parts, their performances were way better than their results. They just could not finish the chances they were creating. Like these, right, are all of Nicholas Jackson's goals this season. And he's got like 17 in all competitions, which is a better first season than Didier Drogba had. But these are all the really good chances that came his way and he either missed, were saved, or were otherwise blocked, right? There are so many other goals that should have happened this season. And this is not me shitting on Nicholas Jackson, by the way. I think there is a hell of a player in there somewhere. And he's still only 22, so he will improve as time goes on. But there were so many times this season where a really good chance fell to him and he did not take it. And I know loads of people don't care about XG and I only try and mention it in these videos when it obviously passes the eye test at the same time, but just this is a measure of the chances he was getting according to XG and this is a measure of how effectively he was converting those chances. Like, you watched Chelsea this season, you saw that, that was real life. And what's just crazy about the season Pochettino has had with this team is that there were long periods in it where it looked like he was definitely getting the sack and it was all going wrong. And that moment against Liverpool in the Carabao Cup final, you didn't really see how there was any way back. But they've only lost one game since that afternoon. Every single start, every single metric has been trending upwards since it all bottomed out at Wembley. And that just doesn't happen. It would have been so easy for this Chelsea team to go under after that match. But they've rallied. Pochettino has gotten to buy in to what he's doing. And it looked like things were going well. And if we can just accept that they should have had at least a couple more wins than they got, then... Look at the league table. If all the English sides in Europe hadn't spectacularly messed up that fifth Champions League space, Chelsea would have gone into the last game of the season with a really good chance of getting into it. And regardless, Aston Villa, who've had a fantastic season, only finished five points above where Chelsea did. Like, that's a win and two draws away from them having the season Villa just had. So yeah, they were actually really close from getting their main objective. Jackson's just had a better first season for Chelsea than Drogba had, technically. Cole Palmer was a great shout for player of the year. Caicedo finally seems to be the player that they thought they were buying. Like, everything's going in the right direction. It's been a pretty good season, all things considered. But the problem and the reason Pochettino was left is not the season that's just happened. It's the season that was about to come. It's been public knowledge over the last couple of days that Pochettino was meeting with Todd Bowley and the rest of the Chelsea owners and management group to discuss where they go next. And the fact that he's left immediately after those meetings 
you can very easily fill in the blanks yourself. He is quite understandably going to want to build on the successes they've had this season, build on the momentum they got towards the end by selling the players that don't fit his style of play and buying ones who do. And that means there probably isn't really a place in this side for players like Enzo Fernandez, like Mudrick, like Raheem Sterling, possibly even Dezazi. And the fact that Chelsea have gone on their best run when all of them have been marginalized and out of the side probably proves his point. But the problem is that he isn't in charge here and this is not his decision. Todd Bowley's name obviously gets thrown around a lot, but the real decision-making tends to come from Berad Egbali, the other co-owner, and the sporting directors Paul Wynn Stanley and Lawrence Stewart. They're the people who are in control of Chelsea as an organization and they want to be heavily, heavily involved in the football side of the business. And they want Chelsea to be a dominant possession team not unlike a Man City or a Real Madrid. And as a result, they see players like Enzo Fernandez, Mudrick and Sterling not as bad fits for what the manager wants to do, but as marquee signings of this administration that should be getting built around. And crucially, they will see a player like Conor Gallagher, who is admittedly a bad fit in a possession side, but the perfect player for a Pochettino team as their most sellable asset. In fact, to be totally honest with you, it wouldn't surprise me at all if this more or less entirely came down to whether Conor Gallagher gets to stay or gets to go. Because if we look at his defensive numbers for an attacking number 10, they're off the charts. They're insane. They're incredible. He's amazing at doing this. You put him in a team that actually plays this way effectively, he'd look like one of the best players in the world. I say that with my entire chest. But then you compare his creation numbers, his ability to unpick defenses, his output from an attacking standpoint, and you simply can't have somebody taking up such a vital position in your team if that's your output. So again, say it with me, an awkward fit for a possession side, which the Chelsea ownership desperately want to be, but the perfect player for a Pochettino team, which Pochettino wants to be. In fact, actually, let me just sum this whole thing up for you, right, in footballing terms, okay? This is Enzo Fernandez's pass map in the Carabao Cup final, where for large parts, right, we'll all agree, Chelsea were on top. It is side to side. It is retaining possession. It is exactly the kind of team that Chelsea's owners wanted them to be. Very rarely does he pass the ball forward. He just keeps possession. He dominates the opposition and they only try and be incisive in the final third. And this is Conor Gallagher's pass map from the weekend where with no Fernandes in the side, he plays in that role. You will see there is virtually no side-to-side -side passing. There is virtually no attempt to retain possession. It is the fundamental difference between horizontal football and vertical football. And in an act of pure poetry, the horizontal football of Enzo Fernandes and the vertical football of Conor Gallagher has left Chelsea at a crossroads. Can you can you see that there? Is the metaphor on the nose enough for you? It is a literal, literal crossroads. And you can see, as a result, why it makes perfect sense for them to just part ways amicably now before it just gets worse. And as disappointed as I am in the whole thing, because if you've watched the channel a lot this season, you'll know I've got this weird, inexplicable soft spot for this Chelsea side. It does kind of make sense like it's either that Pochettino has to go or the ownership has to go and there's only one winner in that scenario so the ownership might as well go out and get somebody who's going to play the brand of football they want which to be fair a lot of this side do actually suit like not to randomly throw names out there but if they were to get a Roberto De Zerbi in par exemple things might work out pretty well in my opinion. But I mean, I'm also the guy who said Chelsea were probably going to win the league at the start of the season. So I mean, maybe just don't blindly take my word for it. Maybe let's maybe let's see what happens. So yes, Chelsea fans, silly season is here and that train is never ever late. Anyway, thank you for watching. If you have enjoyed this video, please do consider subscribing to us here on 442. New subs are the best thing in the world to us. They really do make a massive difference. If you've not already subscribed, please do consider doing so because Think how much there's going to be to talk about this summer. You guys will get a new manager and there's going to be the Euros and signings and transfers. And this is, I promise you, in my opinion, the best place to watch all that stuff. You can, of course, also get me across all the social medias there. That is at Adam Cleary, C-L-E-R-Y. The 442 socials are in the corner of the video. The latest issue of the mag, that was a reasonably good catch, is the Euros edition. And it is on sale now at all good retailers and all the bad retailers because we do not discriminate. Until next time though, I've inexplicably got to now watch Newcastle United versus Tottenham. 
at 10.30 in the morning because nobody cares about anyone's hamstrings anymore, so I'm away to do that. Goodbye. And if you're watching, Maurizio, adios, which I'm like 80% confident is how you say it in uh, Argentinian. Bye.